These are the 10 hard truths in the software engineering industry right now. You guys, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This is so, so important to learn. Software engineering and technology is not oversaturated at all. The only thing that's oversaturated in tech right now is average engineers. The idea that an industry that is constantly hiring, constantly changing is, over, is oversaturated, it's a complete coping mechanism. A portion of this video has been sponsored by HubSpot. I've been in the industry for over seven years, and I've worked at startups to Forbes 500 companies and even big tech companies like Microsoft. And it's shocking how different life is as a software engineer versus what you're taught in school. So this isn't going to be a generic to-do list video. It's something that I put a lot of thought and effort into. So let's get into it. Okay, so number one, coding is only 30% of the job. Okay, I know that might come as a shock, but bear with me. So if we had a pie chart to show exactly what a software engineer does on the job, this is about what it would look like. The mistake that most people make when they're getting into the industry is assuming that their schoolwork will directly translate to what they're doing on the job. This couldn't be further from the truth. For example, in college, I took classes like discrete math, intro to algorithms, and even a lot of just advanced algorithmic computer science courses. But on the job, the tech skills needed are a lot lot simpler and a lot more standardized. But the job involves a lot more engagement in researching and testing and also communicating with your manager and your team as well as customers. So next up, software engineering is a different profession based on company. So remember that pie chart that I showed you in the previous section? This pie chart is very much based on what industry you're in or even the size of the company that you work at. For example, you can think of the size of a company like ingredients in a sandwich. So the bottom layer or the bun are the start Startups. This is where you might expect to code a lot more. Maybe even 60 to 70% of the work will be coding. But that also means that you wear multiple hats. You'll probably spend a lot of hours also testing and shipping code and being an integral part of the main product. The middle of the sandwich, or the meat, is now more structured. These are the mid-sized to large companies, like Forbes 500 companies. They're very standardized. The pie chart that I showed you probably embodies these types of roles the most. Lots of communication, networking, interpersonal relationships, documentation, you catch my drift. You work on standard projects and you have pretty clearly defined goals. Not a lot of ambiguity there. You do code, but not as much as you think. A lot of the work goes into project planning and documentation and communicating with people around you. The top bun, or the last layer, are like the big tech companies. Honestly, there's a little bit of chaos, just like startups, but it's also more standardized than startups. You might end up coding a lot more, but a lot of the work is solving problems and dealing with high ambiguity situations. So for example, you're gonna deal with scalability issues, latency issues, and just overall infrastructure issues that you're gonna to have to continually monitor and fix. And it's dealing with systems that might break often, and you may not know why they break, but you're in charge of figuring it out, implementing the fix, and then communicating to your team what exactly went wrong and how the fix went into place. Life can also be fast paced here, kind of like a startup, but it's also more structured than a Forbes 500 company, like I mentioned. So the next harsh truth is is that you won't work on a company's products. Okay, so this one might be a little confusing, but you probably won't work on a company's main product as a software engineer. When I first joined the industry, I was really excited to work on Target's website or Microsoft's Outlook app or even Xbox, but I never even came near any of those teams. Most software engineers work on internal tools and their customers are other engineers at the company, which is something I never really realized when I first joined the industry. These products are low visibility and your days are just going to be filled with making quick bug fixes or working on unit tests or even updating dashboards or running queries to get certain coverage variability throughout your company. It's still software engineering, but it's not exactly as sexy as you might think. So the AI assisted developer is always going to be better than just a normal developer. This is a classic rule that most people have figured out by now, but you might hear it all the time and you still might not understand exactly what it means. Being an AI-assisted developer doesn't necessarily mean using ChatGPT or Copilot for every single thing. It just means that you're using it as a little buddy to help spell check things that you get wrong. For example, if you want to build out a new feature, instead of saying like, hey, ChatGPT, I have X feature, I want to build, how would I do that? That's too vague. You're giving it too much control and it doesn't have a lot of constraints. So you want to make sure that you're still the brains behind the operation and that you're just using it as a spot checker to maybe make things more streamlined or efficient. But you're the one still making the decisions at the end of the day. Because again, AI is amazing and it's super, super helpful and it skyrockets developers' productivity, but it's not perfect. And it's not a magic ball that you can just 
Robin get the answers from. In fact, I have a really cool free guide from HubSpot that explains step-by-step -step how to get started with using AI as a developer. This guide goes over a breakdown of some of the most popular coding languages and their pros and cons, as well as detailed video explanations on how to learn coding using prompting with ChatGPT. It also gives you very specific examples that you can use for prompting. You can literally just copy and paste this into a chat box, as well as comprehensive exercises to get you started. For example, you've probably heard of a library or a framework, but you probably haven't used one yet. So this is the prompt that the guide suggests using to get started. So how can I integrate a library or framework into my existing programming language project? What are some best practices for this? My favorite section is a building a coding roadmap page. As important as prompting is, it won't really matter if you don't have a goal in mind in which you want to slowly work towards every single day. This guide goes on in detail to talk about project-based goals, an example of a structured week of learning, and how to track your progress effectively. So it's a good idea to read through the whole thing so you can organize your learning and set incremental wins each week. At the very end, you'll be able to check out a Python teacher GPT created by Sundas Khalid. It's a specialized AI tutor designed to assist learners at various stages of their Python journey. I've linked the HubSpot guide in the description below, so you definitely want to check it out. I know I use it all the time. The next one is no one cares how hard you work. I mean, I think this one is self-explanatory. No one actually cares how hard you work. It doesn't matter if you're putting in 60 plus hours a week. Sure, it might look good, but at the end of the day, the output or the result is what actually matters. That's what your manager and your team are actually going to care about. The reality has always been the same. Work whenever you want, as long as you want, just get shit done. That hasn't really changed in the software engineering industry. I remember I was working on two different features at different times. One of those features involved a a lot of complex work. So I would spend hours trying to figure out the perfect design, figuring out the perfect implementation, the perfect testing, everything. It took a lot longer than expected for the deadline and the output was exactly the same. It worked probably as much as it would work if I had just put in 50% of the effort not perfecting it and just focusing on a good result. And in reality, I didn't get that much praise for that. But the next feature I worked on, I didn't put as much effort into perfecting it, but I wanted to make sure that it was shipped in a way that was standardized and that it was acceptable for everyone, including the customer. And when I did that, I got a lot of praise and I did it in half the time. Again, it doesn't really matter how hard you work as long as you're working smart and you're getting things done. So instead, focus on the output and make your manager and your team's life better. If you're able to streamline things and take charge without always asking for directions or just waiting for someone to tell you what to do, then that's enough. It's about the quality of your time at the job, not the quantity of hours that you're working. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so this one has been hard for me to understand sometimes, but your manager is either your best friend or your enemy basically. It doesn't really matter if you output the most on the team or if you're the smartest engineer. If you're not on good terms with your manager, your career progression will stagnate. Believe me, I've experienced both good managers and not the best managers. When I had a good manager, they really empowered me and gave me amazing opportunities that they knew I would thrive in. Even if I was struggling, they would check in with me and make sure that I had all the tools that I needed to be equipped to get to the next level. Now, of course, you have to do things on your own. You have to be held accountable and also take initiative when things go wrong. But if you work in tandem, a good manager will help you get there without you having to guess where you stand with this person. I've also worked with managers where they don't really communicate and it's not very clear where you stand with them or what you need to do in order to get to the next level. And honestly, even when you're doing your work and you're getting things done, and even if you're getting good feedback, sometimes it still doesn't end up working out and you're not able to get to the next level because it's not clear that this person is advocating for you. They're keeping things from you and maybe they're saying that they want to help you but in the background that's not what's happening so just make sure that you know where you stand with your manager because this part is really really crucial and usually you'll kind of know if you have a good manager because you're getting really good work opportunities you're not always going to be developing the best and brightest things but sometimes when you're given opportunities for high impact work or you're being pushed in front of leadership to show your work a lot of times that shows that a manager is being pretty proactive about showing your accomplishments to others so that it can get you ready for a promotion 
emotion. If that's not really happening, then you know that maybe you need to have a conversation with them. So again, maybe this is self-explanatory, but soft skills can actually unlock promotions faster than the hard technical skills. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about being friends with your manager. While people may not start out realizing this, over time they kind of get a feel for, okay, there's more politics and bureaucracy at play than one might understand with software engineering. Of course, it's good to get your work done, but that doesn't really matter if you're not able to showcase what you're doing and talk to leadership and also steer the ship in certain directions. If you don't convince others that your ideas are valuable or that you're valuable, you're not really going to get anywhere in this industry. You could know five frameworks or refactor code in your sleep, but if you can't explain your ideas, build trust, or navigate tough conversations, then you're probably not getting promoted. Sorry to say that. In fact, some of the best engineers I've worked with, they actually weren't the most technical. They were the ones that could align teams well, ask really good questions, and think about why they were doing a certain problem, not just what to do. If you want to grow fast in the industry, learn how to write clearly, speak with confidence, and work with people, especially the ones that disagree with you. That's the real unlock. Also, maybe not a shocker to some people, but no one cares about your fancy code if it doesn't ship. Perfectionism can kill productivity. Clean code matters, don't get me wrong, but delivering the finished result matters more. But there will always be certain criteria or guidelines in place on a team about working according to coding standards. But none of that matters if you're not shipping code fast and iteratively. I learned this when I spent too much time trying to build out the perfectly coded feature on my first project. I was too caught up with what I was taught in school, which was making sure things were clean, passing all the tests, making sure everything was basically perfect for that 100% grade. But that's not always reality. Sometimes you just need an MVP out the door and you can continue to fix things later in later PRs, and if there's work scoped out for that. It doesn't always sound good out loud, but it's just kind of how things work in the industry, and it's something that you need to get used to very quickly. Don't wait for tasks to be given to you. Don't just sit around waiting for tasks, finishing them and saying, okay, I have nothing to do. Go out and figure out what needs to be done. That's kind of what differentiates the cream of the crop from just like average engineers. Even if you're a junior engineer, if you finish your task to completion, make sure you're adding maybe monitoring or visibility for whatever feature you put out, or try to go find bugs or find something where you can just clean up the code on your own. And then talk to your manager in your one-on-ones to say, hey, I finished my task. I started working on this instead, but if there's another priority, let me know and I'm happy to realign. The best engineers that I've worked with don't just do the work. They find the work. They notice broken systems, spot inefficiencies, and propose improvements without being told what to do. Early in my career, I wasted time thinking I was being polite by staying in my lane. But in reality, I was just missing opportunities to grow. In software engineering, initiative is a cheat code. The more you step up and find ways to create value without being asked, the more trusted and promotable that you are. And last, but not least, impact matters not the work that you do. So this one might hurt a little. You can spend hours fixing minor bugs, polishing UI, or doing code cleanup. But if that work doesn't drive meaningful outcomes, no one really cares. That sounds unfair until you realize that it's not about how much you do, but it's about what changes because of what you do. One smart decision that unblocks your team, improves performance, or simplifies a user flow can outweigh an entire sprint of busy work. So I've learned to always ask, what's the impact of this task? Is that making the product better? Is it saving someone time? Or is it just filling space on a status update? At the end of the day, the engineers who focus on outcomes, not just effort, are the ones that stand out. So hopefully these 10 hard truths are something you could resonate with or something you can just learn about if you're newer to the industry. I know that I had to learn many of these the hard way because I literally just thought being a software engineer was coding, finishing your task, and moving on to the next thing. But it's so much more than that. And if you want to thrive in this industry, you kind of have to be aligned with all of the things that I mentioned earlier. So good luck. You got this and see you later.